Well, hello there. It's been a minute since I've updated you on my 7M engine build, so today is the day. In today's video, I'm gonna walk you through the steps that it took to get my engine mounted onto the dyno. And if you've ever wondered, why does it cost so much to run my engine on a dyno and break it in at the machine shop? Well, hopefully this video will answer that question. As you can see, I'm removing a small block Chevy that was the last engine to run on this formerly TRD dyno. That's right, so the stand is currently configured to this engine. The motor mounts, the coolant hoses, the exhaust. So it's time to grab one of my many spare 7M engine blocks and do a little mock-up. Hey YouTube, it's Faye, and for today's video, you can see that I am in the dyno room. I got Charlie here helping me out, and we are gonna mock up this block on the dyno. We're gonna make some adjustments basically so that this sits level. We don't wanna do that obviously with my motor that's like all nice and pristine and clean and everything because we're getting our dirty little paw prints all over this one. We'll get everything set up. So yesterday we took a plate that's actually for a 2UZ of Toyota V8 4.7 liter and cut some holes in it so that it perfectly fit the back of the 7M engine block so that it would be able to mount up. Now we're gonna test fit it and we're gonna adjust these side posts here that attach to the motor mounts and that's gonna get everything set up hopefully. So, all right, here goes. You can see that we've attached this adapter plate to the back of the engine where the transmission would normally bolt up. This is gonna hold the engine securely to the dyno, keep it level, and keep it from moving. This plate is a very precise fit and we have even machined out spaces for the dowel pins. It fits extremely snug. Once we have bolted the rear adapter in place, then we need to figure out the height of the motor mount jacks to get the engine sitting level. I did scribe the former placement of the jacks for the small block Chevy into the tracks, so we would know where to move them back for the next time that we have one of those engines to run. And then we slid the motor mount jacks back towards the rear of the motor to line them up with my 7M engine mounts. I found a pair of adapters for the side mounts in a box of dyno accessories that fit almost perfectly. We just need to fabricate some adapters. So we got our plate attached, and now we've got to adjust these side pieces to hold these motor mounts. Check these out. So Charlie and I just made some adapter plates and these are gonna go in between the Supra stock motor mount and this plate for the dyno. So you can see we've got this one here already and this one that I just finished is gonna be for the other side. So we've got a bunch of different fuel options here. That could actually be a little fuel tank. That is a fuel tank, but since I already had my other fuel tank out of 88 to get cleaned and everything, I figure why not bring the actual Supra fuel tank and then use the actual pump I'm gonna be using. So, I've got some fuel stabilizer in there, so I'm just gonna be adding some fuel a little bit later and I'm gonna strap it down probably. I don't know, it's a little wobbly, but that's where we're at. And then we had an incident where the plate did not work because I had forgotten about the lip here on the oil pan and then there also wasn't enough play so now i'm going to install this adapter plate for the 7m and see if it actually works on the dyno so we're about to find out test fit of the plate and it still has a little bit of room in it out so this is absolutely perfect you can see that it does clear the oil pan so Success! All right, moving on to the next part. So I found a local machinist to make me that custom adapter plate that bolts to the 7M as well as to the dyno drive shaft. It has to be extremely precise and balanced. I brought him a spare crankshaft so he could machine the bolt holes for the engine side. And I brought him another engine adapter from the dyno so that he could machine the holes perfectly for the dyno side and cut threads for the bolts that we use. Now that we have our mounts adjusted and we know our drive shaft is gonna fit with the adapter, it's time to put my engine on the dyno stand. Hey guys, just wanted to give you an update on where we're at because some time has passed and you can see that the engine looks a little different right now. Check it out, I've got my old intercooler just mounted down there. This is one I'm actually gonna put in my other Supra that I'm building, the 88, but for now it is perfect to fit here in the dyno room. Just got it bolted with some mounts, a couple little stands that we found in a box of miscellaneous dyno stuff. And you can see here that I also have the coolant plumbed in and out. So the coolant flow is gonna be controlled by the dyno and the temperature as well. And of course, I've got my drive belt on because my water pump will be running. Another thing we're gonna be doing is building this little bridge for the exhaust to connect my actual downpipe for the engine to the exhaust for the dyno room. And it's gotta be 
obviously we can't have any air leaks going on because we're gonna have to monitor oxygen levels. Got my wide band that I'll be plugging in as well. Had an issue with the motor mount interfering with the hard line for the turbo drain. So just temporarily just stuck a rubber hose. Obviously I know that that's not the way you want it to be, but this is just for temporary use. Okay, people calm down. <laughs> what else? We've got an O2 bung here and this is an EGT sensor in it. And I didn't want to weld the EGT or have Danny weld. Here's Danny. Yes. Hi Danny. <laughs> Cause we all know that I cannot TIG weld. It's a, it's a skill that I do not have. So I didn't want to commit to putting the EGT somewhere. I want it to be able to go wherever. Exactly, this is where we want it. Exactly. I mean, this is this is this, where we yeah. want it, but But also, it may have food stuff. Who, who knows? Who knows? Um, we took the bung that was supposed to be welded into the pipe and welded it to the other side of an O2 bung. And so now it has like a little a little fitting. Yes, it's, it's, our patent it's, pending. Yes, patent, patent pending. <laughs> anyway. So you can go from EGT to O2 bung. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so we just got we got a little adapter there because we wanted it to all be streamlined. You this? Oh, oh man, right. things are happening things here. Are... And over here, I just finished up wiring in the other two sensors that did not come with the drift motion patch harness because I was not committed to those at the time. So now we've got our oil temperature, which is in pin 40 here, and then also our, our EGT which is now in pin 75. So we've got everybody, we've got those two additional sensors. And now I'm going to put this cap back on, plug her in, and we're gonna actually fire up the computer and just make sure that all of our sensors are getting signal, that I wired everything else up correctly. And um, yeah, just do our final final checks on everything because you know, before we waste the tuner's time, we want to make sure that um, everybody is functioning correctly. You know, it looks so awesome. You look at it and it's like, oh, Look how everything is bolted together. Nothing, if you've been following Faye for this whole build, everything's been mocked up three, four times. The clocking of the piece. Now it's all bolted on and it looks sexy. I was just telling her, like, <laughs> this side over here, this isn't just like by luck. There's so much stuff going on and everything is out of its way and everything is in its way. It's just amazing, but that's why the, the mock-up, the mock-up, the, you know, and the frustrations of, I'm not getting anywhere, but you are getting somewhere. Look at it. God, I'm just amazed. I'm, I'm so happy. It's oh, just, that's I mean, it is sexy. It is, it is. To go around that and maybe a little bracket to hold it off or something when you get it in the car. Oh yeah, I got brackets. I yeah, can make that happen. Done an awesome job, hey. This is, like I said, because it does get kind of frustrating that a week's gone by and I haven't, no, but you have been. It's just that it's, it's stuff that no one Months, sees in the background. Years go by. <laughs> oh, it is. I mean, have, people that have been, have been keeping up can, you know, they, they can go back and look at the videos and it's not like, well, Faye hadn't been working on a motor. No, you've been working on it all the time. Every free day I had was spent here. Yeah. I don't have a lot of free days, mind you, but you know. This is awesome. I love that. I love that. That's just going to be... Yeah. And like I said, then you can clock it. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. I mean, that I'm gonna have to figure out when it's actually in the car. Yes, but um, and but for now our... it can blow off right there. Yeah, that's if perfect. it bothers our ears, we can close the door. <laughs> So here's my list of next steps, and I went ahead and just printed this out from the factory repair manual, the PCV system on the 7M, and it is pretty primitive. There's not a lot going on. And, you know, I was just talking to Danny about how every single 7M I've ever seen smokes like a son of a gun. And I do want to get a good PCV system going and not just a catch can, right, Danny? That's so important. Yes, we do. And what you want to do on a race environment, you're racing, everybody just bl blows them off to a catch can. A catch can is a device that does exactly that. All goes into it and it c catches it so you don't put it on the track. And then afterwards, a lot of guys will just drain this and pour it back into the engine or throw it away. Oh. It's a catch can. Yeah. But you're, 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 you're filling this up with oil, so it's not something that could sustain, you know, endurance racing or something. It's made, it's a catch can for dr drag racing. But in a v in any engine, no matter how well the rings are, total seal rings, the best rings in the world, all rings, gases are gonna get past the ring. That, that's part of the combustion process. So what you wanna do is you wanna remove the combustion gases out of your crankcase. What it will do is it will actually get your oil dirty faster and it will etch your bearings. Not only that, piston rings, especially low tension rings and all this stuff nowadays is modern, you might as well embrace it now, need vacuum to help seal the ring. So the ring needs to have vacuum pulled on the crankcase to get the ring to seal before even the combustion process starts. So you need vacuum to make a good ring seal. So that's why a lot of dry cars now have a vacuum pump. 
The engine doesn't make any vacuum, but it has a vacuum pump to pull on the crankcase. So all that is now something that you want to pretty much, you know, it's something that's not going to be a, a, a fun subject. But really, <laughs> it, it, if, you, if you want to, something running really, really good and designed well, pull a good vacuum from your crankcase and your oil will stay cleaner and you won't etch up your bearings. And if you do it right, which we're going to try to, we're going to try to figure this out. Um, if you have a catch can, you can actually have it draining back into the crankcase. But you're not pulling vacuum on your rings. So right. what we really want to do is we, we want to pull good vacuum on the rings. They're going to seal really good. And we're going to evacuate all those gases out of the crankcase. I mean, it, it sounds simple. And, you know, stay tuned. We'll figure out how to do it. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> on this one. There, this is a little bit unique, you know. But we already kind of, you know, this is not something like... Well, what do we say all the time? It seems it was so easy. It took three years and mocking up. Yes, exactly. These fittings didn't just get TIG welded here. Right. Th this thing was mocked up so many times. We oh, already God, yeah. started putting the fittings where we knew. And we have an idea. And, you know, while it's here on the on the, in the dyno, we'll see if our idea works, you know. But, yes. But we're going to try to Proof pull. Proof of concept. A, yeah, we're going to try to pull real good vacuum. But when you pull vacuum from a crankcase, make sure that you have a place for air to get in. If you're going to pull vacuum from a crankcase and suck all that out of your crankcase, which you want it to go through the engine, through the bottom, pull it all out, you better have a place for air to get in. If not, you will suck your seals in. <gasps> so in your front seal on your crankcase and your rear seal on your crankcase, you pull so much vacuum, you're actually going to suck the seal lip in. So that's another thing. If you're going to pull vacuum on your crankcase, you got to make sure that air can get in. And then we're going to be start talking about an orifice because we're going to need to get that balance just right all that to say there's my pcv setup <laughs> you can see here i just have the factory hose snaked in between my sensors for now connecting the crankcase to the valve cover and then my valve covers i've just got two hoses going to a little catch can there which is going to vent to atmosphere and i'll just put a little filter on top of that let's go over here and let me just show you what i got oil wise so the 7m takes according to the factory service manual five and a half quarts if you have a 7m then you know that you fill them up to the full line on the dipstick and then you add another quart so yes i run six and a half quarts in my 7m actually more than that because i've always had a larger external oil cooler so I've always actually used about seven quarts. So here I have eight quarts because the lines are new. I've added more. You can see that I've got this drift motion, beautiful billet piece. I wish you could even see that when it's in the car, but remote oil filter. And that's a Toyota factory oil filter. I've got three of them for the, uh, the break in, even though my rings are already broken in, but my camshafts aren't. And then it's going to my oil cooler. And this is awesome. There's actually even a part number you can see on that. This is from a Saab 9000, which is a yeah, performance Saab and it's been awesome for me and then this is the drift motion or the mocal thermostatic oil sandwich plate so this is like a 90 10 setup where it's always got a little bit of flow so when it finally reaches 180 degrees it's not just going to dump a bunch of cold oil in there like, there's always a little bit flowing so it's like warming up slowly which is nice and so what we're going to do is right before we go to fire i'm actually going to feed pressure feed oil into the engine and turn it over and lubricate everything up before we actually run the engine. I'm actually not going to use Amsoil oil in the engine when it's actually running, but I am going to use this break-in oil. I think this is one of the best break-in oils and this is something Danny uses. So yeah, obviously <laughs> I trust Danny more than anything. And we've got a conventional SAE 30 oil. And then if you've been following my build since the beginning, when I found out that the cylinder head was warped, I was using a Valvoline VR1, like a racing uh, synthetic oil and that's what I'm going to use in this vehicle because from the very very beginning I remember Danny asking me what oil did you use because I had put quite a bit of miles on the engine with a warped cylinder head and had very little damage very little scoring in the cylinder head and so at that point I vowed to only use that oil for the rest of my life in this vehicle because it had legit proven itself under the worst of circumstances, right? So, um, but don't change, don't change what works. The only thing I'm going to change is I'm not going to do 2050 anymore. I'm going to go to the factory 1030. So, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm yes, that's, that's a, 
that's another topic for another time. Oils, I'm very passionate about oils. So I just fired up the Infinity and just verified. I had all of my sensors unplugged and I actually still have my oxygen sensors unplugged. I'm gonna be running two different ones, one for a gauge and then one that actually talks to the Infinity. And that is because I, I don't wanna plug them in right now and have them heat up. Um, and then just burn up sitting in their little plastic, <laughs> their little protective sleeves there. So, but I just went through and checked every single one of my sensors and just verified that not only was it reading, but it was reading in range and all my wiring was correct and I was getting my five volt references and everything was great. You can see how I've got everything set up is I've got my negative bank here, my positive bank here, so little distribution blocks, and then I have my battery on a trickle charger and then I'm just using those jumper cables. I cut the end off of the jumper cables and just attach them to my little blocks right there. Over here, we've got the throttle cable. So there we are. And that is actually connecting into the dyno room. So I'll be able to be sitting, oh, hello me, with my little camera and a tripod dinghy. So I'll be able to be sitting inside the dyno room with all the computers and everything in there. So I'll be able to see the information from the dyno in terms of my horsepower and torque numbers. I'll be able to see the actual coolant flow and all that stuff from inside there. Obviously my engine is gonna be extremely loud because I've got open wastegate dumping. So we'll, you know, we'll be, we'll be protected in there. And then if anything blows up, which hopefully it won't knock on wood, uh, we'll be, you know, protected behind the glass. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to be controlling the throttle from inside. We also have a super high dollar blow by meter here. So after we get the initial tune and I'm happy on some stuff, I might actually take some time and design like a real positive crankcase ventilation system. The 7M doesn't have a good one, but that's another topic for another time. Setting this up was kind of a pain just because I'm not really great with computers or electrical stuff. I'm kind of still learning all this stuff, but I got to put this back on. But basically, I'm getting all of my power and ignition switch signals from my B1 plug, which is this one. I guess one of the reasons why this was a little bit difficult to figure out is that the 89, it's like in a weird split year. So a lot of the diagrams, you really have to make sure you get a diagram for an 89. You can't just go on forums and be like, hey, what plug goes where? It doesn't, does not work that way. So I received fuel pump control signals, my ignition signal, and my EFI main power through the B1 plug, also through my C1 plug. And you can see that I am a visual learner. So here in pink are all the pins that I use to just power up the infinity to get it to talk to the computer. So we've got the C110 plug, which is constant battery power. These are all grounds. Oh, and then ignition switch. Uh, an ignition switch is our really important one that turns everything on. 16. So I will power everybody off and get the battery back on the trickle charger before I leave for the day because it is almost five o'clock. But here is the update. All right, so that is where I am at today. So hopefully tomorrow that fitting comes in and I can actually just finish connecting just that one hose, add my oil and actually take the dyno out of winterization mode and do first fire. But I'm gonna save all that for my next dyno video. Hopefully this gave you an insight into sort of what it takes to get an engine on a dyno and do a tune, why it costs so much and you know, sort of everything that goes into the process. So now this really feels like this engine build has been going on for a million years and it kind of has. This is probably my longest relationship in my life. And I'm finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, which is super cool. So thanks so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye. Fern is all about it. Are you on a low-fat diet, Abby?